start and see whether uh, we made it happen before so we can make it happen again. I'll just I'll crack on. One of the terrifying things about talking at a conference like this, as an academic, is I'm always not sure about what I should be saying. Because I'm not a teacher, I've never worked in schools, I'm a researcher. And what can I actually say to a conference like this that will be useful to you? What can I actually say that you don't already know? There's enough, thank you very much for that, as I've just demonstrated. There's enough combined expertise in this room that you can actually work out how to do technology in schools a hundred times better than I can. So what I thought I'd try and do today that could be genuinely useful for you is just perhaps start off a conversation that we can carry on for the next two days. And as I said there, try and reset the way that we think about digitization and schools and hopefully find some common ground for some slightly more interesting conversations about technology and education than you might often find at an event. Not necessarily like this, but at a lot of ed tech events, people talk about the same things in the same ways. So if nothing else, I want to just try and give you a different starting point. And I wanted really just to ask three really deceptively simple questions. And hopefully these are not as dumb as they seem. But they're really interesting things to start and think about at the beginning of an event like this. Why are we all actually here? What have we got in common? What do we actually want to get from a day like today? What is it about technology and digitization and schools that we're collectively interested in? So it's kind of finding some common ground and also finding some common ground about how we should be approaching digitization and schools. And then secondly, after the why are we all here, what's it all about question, what problems are we actually facing um, when we talk about digitization and schools? Because I think there's lots of things that we know we're inevitably going to face whenever we try to do anything with digital technology and schools. And yet we sometimes don't really kind of acknowledge them when we start doing something new. I'm not saying that we're reinventing the wheel every time we do something new, but we have things that come up again and again and again. And then thirdly, because you want to be positive and I want to be positive, how can we possibly think otherwise? How can we move forward? How can we begin to start thinking of ways of not just reinventing the wheel. So this is not necessarily a 12-step program to progress. This is more a three-step program. I'm not claiming I'm going to cure you of anything. But I do want to give you something to work with um, as we go through the next, the next couple of days. So the first step of my three-stage program, why are we all here? Now, it's really interesting to read the uh, literature for today seeing lots of different words in Swedish, which I've Google translated, and I think there's lots of reasons why people are here. Lots of C words, or C words in English at least. Coding seems to be a big thing in Sweden at the moment that everyone's panicking about. Digital competence. I've read about creativity. I've read about community. There's all sorts of... Um, but I think the main C word is actually change. The thing I think we have in common here today is that we're all interested in change. You don't get involved with digital technology unless you want to try and do things differently. And I think in education, we don't get involved with digital technology unless we want to do things slightly better, so differently and better. So change, I think, is the one thing that we have in common. And I think some of the other keynotes are also going to expand upon this notion of change, because it's a really useful way of focusing our, our, in, our, our interests. We're not just here for fun. We're not just here for enjoyment. We're not just here to show off neat things that we know about technology. There is a bigger purpose for using technology in education, and I think that purpose is change. And if you want to be specific about it, it's change in schools. We should be all interested in making a difference in schools, whether it be to the way that students engage in learning, the way that teachers teach, the outcomes of actually being in a school, the life chances of students actually going to school. This is the key thing, I think, that we we're all focused on here, change in schools. Only then do I think technology come into the equation. We're not necessarily interested in technology first and foremost. We're interested in change in schools first and foremost, and then how technology comes in. I think that's a really interesting way to try and focus the discussions that we're going to have over the next two days. The focus should always be 
on schools and teachers and students and communities and neighborhoods and society and all of those bigger picture things. The technology <laughs> is a really interesting way of thinking about that, but it's not the first thing that we're interested in. So if we think that we've got those things in, in common, it then becomes slightly more worrying, everything that we're talking about today, because change is really, really complex. Change is not easy and straightforward. Change is a really tricky thing to be dealing with. So if you think about what we're interested in today, we might be interested in the changes about coding in schools, digital competency, we might be interested in maker education, learning analytics, big data, algorithms, or simply just using the next big thing. All of those technical changes, those digitization changes, relate to a bunch of really tricky things that we have to try and achieve in education. Now, all of those issues, those digital issues, are going to be related to things like new forms of leadership, different forms of professional development, different resources or ways of procuring resources, different types of policy, changes to the curriculum, changes to all of those are things we get, we're de dealing with today. And those are all huge things to try and deal with, and huge things to get right. And on top of those things, which are all quite tangible, and we can try and at least try and affect them, there's a whole bunch of other things which we're also trying to change, which is far, far more tricky. So we're also talking about different practices, or changing practices of students and changing practices of, of teachers. We're talking about changing the culture of schools and changing the culture of school communities. And we're also talking about changes in people's dispositions and sensibilities. Now, those are huge things. You know, those are massive things to try and, try and address. But I think that's what we're all here to try and do over the next couple of days. So the ultimate question, given all of that, then, is what the hell can we do? There are no, it's just, these are such big questions. It's worth bearing in mind, and I think that means what the hell, what the, I was quite worried about having, I've got two swear words in this talk, I was quite worried about doing it, because I, I, I know Swedes quite well. Then I saw that you have at least an hour and a half tomorrow dedicated to shitty robots. So I thought, well, if you're going to do shitty robots, I can say WTF. I'll use one more swear word in a minute. But this is the big thing, what the hell are we going to do? And it's a really interesting thing to think about in terms of this event. Because in theory, an event like this is where we can ask, answer these questions. You are the most engaged people in this area. That's why you're here. You know about tech, you know about digital. You're the early adopters, you get technology. So in, in an ideal world, you literally just come to an event like this, you get some inspiration, you talk to people, you maybe get some solutions and some answers, and then you go back to your municipalities and your schools, and then you, you do great things. But we know that it's not as simple as that. A lot of people who are a lot smarter than us have been doing this for the past 40 years in terms of technology and schools. And as you know, if you go into any school in 2017, things have not turned out perhaps as well as we've been thinking over the last 40 years. So if it was that easy, it would have already happened. And we wouldn't have to come in. So it's really good to come to an event today with our eyes open, that we've been trying to do this for 40 years now. And if things have changed, they would have changed already. That's not to say that we should give up, or we should stop being ambitious and hopeful, but I think we just need to be a bit more mature or adult about technology and education. Now, I love the fact that it's nearly 40 years since computers first started coming into schools. Most of what we're trying to do today is not necessarily the first time we've tried to do it. So I think it's 39 years since the ABC80. Um, I, I was just learning a minute ago about Compass. We've been trying to have coding in schools for 35 years, 36 years. A lot of this is not the first time we've tried it. So if computers in schools is nearly 40 years old, if it was a person, it would be thinking about have, buying a house, settling down, having kids, getting a mortgage, maybe thinking about a pension. It would be doing some quite boring things. If computers in schools was a person, it would have definitely moved on from the very childlike phase of, oh, isn't everything wonderful, everything's fantastic, let's play, let's be... That's what you'd expect a kid to be like. And it should have also have moved on from the really rebellious, yeah, we're going to smash the system, transform things, disrupt things. That's a kind of teenage mentality. I'm arguing now that we need to move to a much more boring adult way of thinking about ed tech. Maybe I'm just projecting from my own experience, but we're no longer as young as we used to be. 
And I think we just need to accept that there's no magic, amazing kind of revolution or no amazing disruption and everything isn't awesome. And we need to be less idealistic and perhaps more realistic about schools and education and our lives in general, maybe. So I don't want to put a downer on things. I think I may have already succeeded in doing that. But I want to think about just how can we be a bit more realistic about tech and education. So get rid of all the hyperbole, get rid of all the over-enthusiasm, get rid of all that kind of bleeding edge talk that you often hear at tech conferences. And I'm really, I, mean, I, I trusted Carl that this would be a really cool event, but it's brilliant that you haven't got ed tech vendors outside trying to sell you stuff. You haven't got a marketplace, you haven't got sales pitches from companies coming up and just, because that's what normally is the kind of the ed tech world. We get kind of this overall cheerleading for technology. And it's always, I'm endlessly amused reading about technology and education because you have I've got this faintly ridiculous discourse about how everything's going to be disrupted. Everyone's digital natives. We're in the fourth education revolution. All of this kind of cheerleading and hype. And in, in some ways, we set ourselves up to fail. Now, this is all kind of, as I say, the, the technology industry and the kind of the gurus that stand up on stage and tell us this stuff. But the danger is that we start kind of taking that on ourselves as well, as educators. And this talk of revolution and disruption and game-changing, it kind of distorts what we're actually trying to do here. Are you getting invitations to go to the BET show next year? Yeah. This, is, this is really doing my head in. Uh, looking to the future, turning tomorrow, today's ideas and tomorrow's reality, uncovering jobs that don't exist yet, ultimately changing the game. All of this kind of, this is stuff I think that we need to move along from. We need to be grown up about this. We need to think that this is some... Um, the hubris of this just astounds me. This is the Bet Show conference program from earlier on in the year. Be a game changer. Martin Luther King, Charles Darwin, Emmeline Pankhurst, Marie Curie. Be the next game changer. So this idea that technology and education is akin to Martin Luther King or Charles Darwin, maybe we're just getting a bit ahead of ourselves. I think this is perhaps not as good. I think... And this is my second swear word of the day. I think we should call this out for what it is, and it is bullshit. And I think we need to move on from this ed tech bullshit. Now, I'm using bullshit in a very academic way. I'm not being just crude for the sake of it. I would definitely recommend that you read Harry Frankfurt's On Bullshit from 20, 2004. There you are, there's an academic reference for you. A really good book, it's online. And it's come back into fashion now with Trump, because if you read this now through the eyes of Trump, a lot of what Franklin says, Frankfurt says is perfect. He's arguing that bullshit is language which sets out, does, not, does not set out to deliberately lie or hide the truth, per se. Instead, it's language that's repeated quite mindlessly and without any regard for how things really are. And in some ways, this reminds me a lot about how we talk about technology and education. Because this is one area where people can kind of say anything they want about the future with no kind of comeback when those visions and kind of um, predictions are not realized. This is a way where a lot of people just talk without real concern about the realities of what it is that they're, they're talking about, which is schools and students and teachers. So people can talk about the fourth education revolution or game changing or disrupting school 2.0 when none of that actually really kind of takes place on the ground which is a real concern. So I think language is a really important thing to get right for today. We need to be much more careful about the language we use and the way that we talk about schools and change and where how technology fits into that. I don't think this is going to be a, day, a, a two days of bullshit. I'm sure it won't be. But we need to kind of carry that on when we go to other conferences like this and when we go back into, into the workplace. And instead, I think we need to do three different things about when we talk about technology and education. We need to be more honest. And by honest, I don't mean that we're, we're kind of lying at the moment. But I think we just need to be more straightforward about the realities of what's the nitty gritty of what's going on in classrooms today. So not just talking about the potential and the what ifs around technology and education, but talking about the what is actually going on at the moment. And one of the things that I've written about in the past is moving around beyond this idea of state of the art, which is a lot of ed tech talk is about state of the art and talking more about state of the actual, the technology that we actually have today, rather than the technology that we want tomorrow, and the schools that we actually have today, rather than the schools that we want tomorrow. Because if we have ed tech as being a kind of a, 
a wish fulfillment space, then people get very frustrated because often those wishes are not fulfilled. So I think we need to be more honest, and I also think we need to be more uncertain. Education and digitization, education and technology is a field where it, people tend to be really sure about themselves. R quite cocky, is that a word that translates into Swedish? Here's a solution, here's a problem, I'm going to fix it, this is what's going to happen, this is what's, you know, 10 years time, 60% of jobs, we don't even, all stuff like that. Very rarely do you hear people say, I'm not sure, I've no idea, we don't know, we can't be certain. But here are a few things we might like to try. And I think a space like today and tomorrow is a really good space for us to just pretend, <laughs> get rid of the pretense that we know everything and that we're sure about everything and just try and just try things out, probably with the expectation that we're not sure how they're going to turn out. And if we could do that in terms of policy and the way that technology is talked about by policymakers and school leaders and school managers, then that would be even better. But this is a space I think that needs to be a lot more than just empty promises and inflated expectations. And last of all, I want us to be critical. And by this I don't mean um, anti-technology, but I do think we can be constructively critical about the way that digital, digitalization is taking place in education systems. I think we need to ask and try and think up really difficult questions to ask about the technology in education. My favorite difficult question is, what is new here? Which is a really interesting question to ask of anything in education technology. What is new here? I think we need to make comparisons with our previous experiences. It's really important to have a sense of history, ABC, AT, Compass. And it's also really interesting to look at the bigger picture, to look at the problems and also the unintended consequences of using technology in, a, a, in schools. So I think I want us to be sceptical. I don't want us to be cynical or anti-technology. We're not Luddites, but I think we could be more sceptical. Um, still concerned with making things better and making a change, but perhaps being slightly a little bit glass half empty rather than glass half full. So, I've written down next to say this is not meant to be a buzzkill. <laughs> I don't want to get too depressed about this. You can still have fun and mess around with shitty robots and just you know, tinker about, but I also want you to do that with a purpose. Whilst you're enjoying yourselves, remember that we are here for this kind of bigger, bigger picture thing. We are trying to kind of change schools. And it's not going to be easy, and it's not going to be straightforward. It's not just a case of buying an app and turning it on or plugging and playing. So having said all that, we can just move on to the second step. What problems do we inevitably face? And I think this is a really interesting thing to think about in terms of um, all of the things that you're coming to this room with today. Coding, digitalization in the curriculum, maker of technology, algorithms, blah, blah, blah. I think there are some things that we need to properly acknowledge when we're having these conversations about these, these new things. So the first thing I think we need to face, and this is just a personal bugbear of mine, is the learning problem. Every time you hear people talk about education and technology, learning is the one thing that people often talk about. They'll talk about teaching, but they'll also talk about learning. And in some ways, I think this is a real red herring. You hear the word learning bandied around a lot. These are learning technologies used by learners in order to learn. Even just talking about students as learners, I think, is a problem. Because you're assuming that they're learning. Often students don't learn. Often teachers don't teach. They're doing other things. So I want to kind of challenge this idea about learning and try and move us beyond just talking about the digital and schools in terms of learning. First of all, even if we are using technology for learning, there's very, very little evidence that technology directly leads to better learning or any type of learning. There's no evidence in terms of correlations as, uh, and causation. Sorry, there's certainly evidence in terms of correlation. Um, what, this is the holy grail of academic ed tech research, is to prove the link between learning and technology. But if you think about it, learning is such a complex thing, taking place in such a complex setting, that it's ridiculous to say one thing will then lead to another thing much, much more complicated than that. But more importantly, as you will know, most technology that's used in schools is not actually meant to be concerned with learning at all. A lot of the digitization that takes place in schools is not necessarily aimed at learning. It might be aimed at studying, which is something very, very different. So a learning management system, for example, I would argue, is not focused on learning. 
It's, le it's focused on management, and it's focused on management of students. And those technologies are really important in terms of the way that schools are run and the way that schools operate. And so in some ways, if we only focus on learning as the focus of what we're doing, we're selling ourselves short. Because A, that's not what we're often trying to do with technology in schools, and B, there's no real kind of reason to believe that the technology will enhance learning at all. So I think we need to move on from this idea of everything about technology and education to do with learning. And Yurt Biesta is a really interesting philosopher of education to, to read up on. Um, He's currently based in Luxembourg in the UK, but his, his stuff is really, really interesting. If you want to kind of think about technology, uh, sorry, think about schools from a more philosophical perspective, Biesta is great. And he's written a lot about learnification, the way that everything in education over the past 10 years has been co-opted into this learning discourse. You can't do anything in a school without it being about learning. And he argues that this translation of everything that we talk about in education in terms of learning and learners is really restrictive because it makes us, distracts us from the other issues in schools, which is still really, really important. And as you know, working in schools, schools are based around all sorts of things to do with society and culture and economy and politics. But as well as trying to get kids to learn things, we're also trying to give kids skills, dispositions that allow them to do something in the world. It could be getting a job, it could be civically engaged, it could be fighting uh, kind of activist battles, but we're trying to give kids skills to do things. He also talks about socialization, the idea that schools have the socializing function of fitting students into uh, particular social, cultural, or political orders in society. And he also talks about subjectification. A lot about what we're trying to do in schools is to give students a sense of who they are in the world. Now, those are all really important things which also fit into what we're trying to do with digital technologies. So I think some of the key questions that we're going to need to ask today are not necessarily what works and why with technology, but why are we doing this? What do we actually want to achieve with this use of technology? Why are you trying to teach students about the moral implications of fake news or social media and, and <coughs> in the social sciences? Why are we teaching students to program and to code? It's not all about learning. There are other things that we need to think about as well. So, that's number one. The second thing is an obvious thing. The problems that we face. And the problem that we face is that technology doesn't solve anything at all. I don't think any teacher or any, anyone working in education really believes that technology solves stuff. But we're told all the time that technology does solve stuff. Now, as Evgeny Morozov tells us, this isn't just an education problem. The way that we're conditioned to think about technology now in education, uh, sorry, in society, is it as a solution. This idea of solutionism is rife throughout everything that we're sold in terms of Uber and Airbnb and the idea that we can suddenly transform politics through technology. We're told this all the time. But in education, it's a big idea that technology is a way of overcoming deep-rooted problems in our schools. It could be about student engagement or student achievement. It could be about fixing STEM or whatever it is, but we're, we're told that technology can fix things. And I think this is something that we really need to talk about because we know that change doesn't work like this. Schools are not just about problems that have a technical solution and therefore change happens. We're going to talk later on today about second order effects. We're going to talk later on today about unintended consequences. So we need to get beyond this idea of the technical fix which has been around since the 1980s, since the ABC 80. They were sold to us with promises of fixing problems. We've got to get beyond that and generally think about the way that technology and change takes place. Which leads me to the third point, that the outcomes of technological change are really difficult to actually anticipate. This is a key point, and I think this is something that's really important to reflect upon today. We never know exactly what will happen when we do something with technologies in schools. So, I thought I'd give an example to think about this in terms of coding. What do you genu genuinely think will happen with this current push for coding in Swedish schools? Do you all think it's going to lead to all of the stuff that you're told is going to happen as a result? <laughs> I'm not sure. It's interesting to think it through. So, if you have a think about it, we've got this crazy push 
and I'm going to say it's a crazy push. Crazy can be good as well as bad, but it's crazy. The way that program, programming and coding, mini computers, all of this stuff is being pushed all around the world. So you've had Estonia and Denmark and the UK pushing programming into their curricula. The US has been a huge push. Sweden's now following suit. You've got cohorts of teachers now being trained to, to teach computer science in classrooms. You've got these well-funded organizations like coding.org offering outside tuition. You've got things like the Microbit and the Raspberry Pi, or Scratch, all of these things. There's a huge push going on now. I think you might realize that it's reached kind of peak hype when the Trumps start getting involved. So I don't know if you've seen Ivan Ivanka Trump. This is her big thing now. Um, this was announced last, last uh, month. I'll quote from the New York Times. Ivanka Trump, Mr. Trump's eldest daughter, and one of his senior advisors, has organized an effort over the, next, the past two months to direct $500 million in combined federal and corporate money to all schools with the goal of trying to bridge a coding skills divide that she said is hurting the American economy. So coding is getting a massive push under Trump. They're doing all sorts of other stuff to education, but coding is a great thing. It's really interesting when you think about this, because coding in the US was really cool last year when it was Obama. It's really interesting to compare that. Same hat, same technology, same idea. There's a slight difference, isn't there, in terms of who looks like they're actually understanding what's going on. <laughs> Who's wearing the hat. <laughs> I know I'd prefer. So when I say to you, technology and politics and education, there is politics to ed, ed and tech, think about that. It was cool when it was Obama spruiking it, when it's Obama Trump, it's slightly less worrying. But I mean, it's really, really interesting that we've got this crazy push for coding in schools, and it's not just Sweden doing it. And as I've said before, it's not the first time we've tried it. So why are we just kind of talking about it like we've got no idea what's going on and it's all a big panic? I think we can do better than that. Now, if you think about the, the, the push for coding, there are a lot of um, grand claims and hopes being made for it. So as Ivanka Trump points out, it's going to solve this problem of work, workplace skills, for example. We're going to get more programmers and coding skills for the new economy. In particular, we can overcome gender divides, and um, particularly the, 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 the pipeline into STEM, science, technology, engineering, and maths education. We're told also it might lead to transferable skills in terms of computational thinking, problem solving, teamwork, design thinking. There's all sorts of stuff being, att being attached to this. And as you know, from the other countries, we've got some initial good news. More students are now taking coding. There's been reports that students are more interested in coding. They're more aware of the key concepts. And they're more knowledgeable and excited. That's what we're told. But more crucially, it's really interesting to see the emerging evidence, which is slightly less um, solutionism. So with colleagues in um, Gothenburg's Gulit, the uh, Learning and Information Technology Group. We wrote a blog post about this in May, which is, have a look, read through it if you're interested in the emerging evidence about coding in schools. But the way it's turning out is to be a lot more complicated than we would have expected. So for example, the IT industry are increasingly unhappy in the US and the UK about the low level forms of coding that are actually taking place in schools. They re refer to it as um, drag and drop coding and coding that is nowhere near the type of coding that the IT industry actually want people to learn. So there's, there's concerns about the authenticity uh, and the content that's being used. There's n very little evidence at the moment for transfer of skills. This idea that by learning to code, you'll learn these other skills. So there's a really interesting randomized controlled trial that was done recently of the code clubs in the UK that found out that a year's worth of code clubs, kids going to after school clubs and learning to code, led to um, significant improvements in their competence, competency to code, which is kind of what you'd expect. No impact at all on computational thinking or other broader learning skills. Why would you expect there to be otherwise? But it's really interesting to actually see, oh, and then people start backtracking, saying, well, you know, we never really said it would lead to computational thinking anyway, and what does computational thinking mean? And it all starts to unravel before your eyes. There's also concerns about the nature of the teaching um, in schools. So um, emerging evidence that narrowly technical and procedural, that students are learning to code rather than coding to learn, which is a really interesting kind of uh, nuance that often gets, gets missed out. Evidence that teachers are struggling to actually develop the curriculum and deliver the curriculum. 
So I think in the UK, 12 months after their curriculum was introduced, 40% of teachers, primary school teachers, reported not having had adequate professional development, and one third still reported they lacked the ability to teach the new subject matter. And the most concerning thing, perhaps, from the UK's perspective, is that the latest figures show that there's no increase in students um, taking computer science, going on to further study at a higher level. And the percentage of girls is slightly falling, which is counterintuitive to what you'd, you've been told. Now, I'm not saying that will happen in Sweden. I'm not saying that will happen elsewhere. And it may be different in a year's time in the UK. But it's clearly the change associated with <coughs> millions of pounds, lots of technology, lots of curriculum, lots of professional development, wow. is not leading to all the stuff that we told it was. And the conclusion for this blog um, was governments around the world are finding that rewriting the national curriculum documents is the easy part. Achieving genuine systematic change, systemic change, <laughs> requires sustained resourcing commitments over long periods of time. It's really tricky to, to achieve. Now, if you've got a sense of history, none of this may be much of a surprise. Because when you look back to the 1980s, say in the UK, when they had a similar thing, micros in schools, coding for everybody, similar things happened. So often the research looking back to it refers to the fact that the students that learned to code were the bright, white, middle class boys. Boys who are clever and engaged and a middle class. That computers in schools and coding in schools quickly became part of a phantom curriculum because it was cross-curricular, it wasn't anyone's responsibility. And that learning about BASIC was the main focus, BASIC being the programming language, rather than learning with BASIC. So a lot of the stuff that's coming out of the UK now is what was found in the 1980s when we, when we tried this beforehand, which is a really interesting way of thinking about it. But also, if you think about what happened in the 1980s with programming in schools, it suggests that we shouldn't perhaps give up on coding this time around. Because the 1980s coding in, in schools was really interesting for three different reasons. Although it was mainly bright, white, middle-class boys, some of those boys went on to then become games developers, um, software programmers, really, really innovative engineers in the world of computer science. And they directly say, because I did a computer in the uh, BBC Micro in the 1980s, that's why I got into programming. But the most interesting thing whenever you talk to techie people about the, the, the computers in schools is that the development of the BBC Micro, that's the British version of the um, ABC80, led to the development of this little chip called the ARM chip. So the, the, the developers that made the, the school's computer made a chip to make it work. This chip is now in every smartphone in the world. It's one of the most important microchips in the whole of the, whole of the past 20 years and came from that push to get computers in the British schools. Now, if you'd said at the beginning the outcome of this pro push will be the development of this amazing chip, no one would have believed you at all. But it's a completely kind of unintended consequence of technology in schools. I would have hate to have not have achieved the development of that chip. So I would never say they shouldn't have done it in the 80s. On the other hand, you're not going to achieve exactly what you think you're going to achieve. The difference in the 1980s was that we weren't hyping coding in schools up to the skies with these massive expectations, that it was very tentative and it was very kind of open-ended. So it's really, really tricky to actually kind of think about technological change. And one of the things I think that comes out from that example about coding and all the other history of ed tech is this idea about context-specific nature of change and the iterative nature of change. So we know that technologies in education are shaped by the context that they're in. It doesn't make any sense to talk about the iPad in the classroom, because the iPad in my school is going to be very different to the iPad in your school, because of the school, because of the teachers, because of the community, because of the types of things that you're trying to do with it. Technologies are shaped by the context in which they're in. And if you read Larry Cuban, who's a really interesting historian of technology, he talks about this in terms of the situationally constrained nature of any technology in schools. And he talks about how the grammar of schooling shapes how the technologies are used. And by grammar of schooling, he means things like time, space, curriculum, assessment, classroom factors. And he came up with this really memorable phrase, computers meet classroom, classroom wins. The way that classrooms kind of shape what goes on with technology.
in very context-specific ways. And the other thing to think about in terms of change is this idea that change is not linear. You don't introduce a technology and then suddenly change happens. I quite like this idea about remediation, the idea that technologies change iteratively. They'll change some practices, they'll change some ways of doing things, and some things will stay the same as well. And so this idea of the ghosts of old ways of doing things living on in the new technologies that we have is a really interesting way to think about change in schools. The fact that we have new technologies designed to do the things that we want to do and the way that we're used to doing things gives an idea about why the technologies that are used in schools often tend to kind of repeat the same old things. So if you think about interactive whiteboards, for example, it's really interesting to think about the hype about interactive whiteboards. And they were going to change classrooms. Everyone was going to be innovative and collaborative. And kids were going to take charge of the classroom. And it would lead to this social, cultural way of doing things that was very, very different to a normal classroom. And then eventually, everyone got very dispirited and said, well, they're just dumb boards that teachers just use as a kind of interactive blackboard. Remediation, the old technology of the blackboard is fitting with the new technology and the practice. What's interesting now is if you go into schools now, once people have forgotten about whiteboards, changes have happened. Teachers and students and classes are using these technologies in slightly different ways. So we're going into primary schools now and we're seeing that student primary school kids are watching huge amounts of instructional videos and TV programs and films, way, way, way more than they would have done even 10 years ago. Because the whiteboards are in the classrooms, the teachers have got comfortable with them, and all of a sudden, the film is becoming a really important part of the way that the classes take place. So all that stuff about education technology from 40, 50 years ago, never really kind of taking hold in the schools, is suddenly taking place, but because of this technology that was introduced 20 years ago. So we can't predict change, and we can't also say that change is definitely going to happen straight away. And two other things very, very quickly before I get on to what can we do about this. I've always ignored leadership when I've ever I've done any research on technology in schools. It always seems to me the most least important part of, of schools is leadership. Having done three years' work in schools now, looking at how technology is used, I'm convinced leadership is the most important thing. So I'm going to do a complete vault fast about that. It's really important to talk about leadership, I think. We tend to just overlook leaders as a key part of um, the equation with technology and education. None of this technology use takes place by itself. And, but leadership is an issue that's really, really rarely called out in discussions of schools and technology. Now, and this is a complete no-blame statement. I would hate to be a school leader. It's one of the most difficult things in the world to do. There's so much stuff, so many balls in the air that people are trying to juggle. And the leadership of school technology is a really complex thing. You've got how their technology is being used in the classroom, you've got the teacher education, the professional development, you've got maintaining the infrastructure, you've got um, working out the procurement of the technology, you've got all of the various legal and ethical issues that are associated with using technology in schools. It's a really, really difficult <laughs> thing to do. And you find at the moment that leadership of technology in schools often, from a top-down perspective, is just principals and deputy principals just trying to firefight, keep things going, try and just keep the show on the road. And that where technology leadership is taking place, it's very kind of bottom up from individuals like yourselves that go in and do something and try and get people interested. And it's not very kind of coordinated, but also it's not very sustained and systematic. So you find pockets of good practice mm. not spreading out throughout a school. And I think leadership is a really, really important thing to talk about never really gets talked about very much in technology. And then the last problem that I think we face with all of this, and this is the big elephant in the room, that at the end of the day, this is not the most important thing in the world. It's not even the most important thing in... in <laughs> none of this really matters. If I went into a school tomorrow and said to the teachers, what's the most important problem that you're facing? None of them are going to say technology. I bet you if I went into a school and talked to the IT technicians and said, what's the most important problem that you face? None of them are going to say the technology. There are so things like time, money, assessment, curriculum. All of these things are really, really important. The elephant in the room with a lot of this stuff is technology use in education does not have to be very good. Good enough is often enough. And so a lot of people are just trying to kind of get by. 
Technology and digitization is still not mission critical to schools doing things, and therefore schools are just trying to kind of do stuff around the edges. In the meantime, schools are really concerned with making sure that kids come to school, get examination results, go into jobs, that there are still, you know, roofs on the school. So all of these things are much, much more important. And so, if nothing else, that can make education technology seem to be full of hubris. <laughs> So we need to try and work some ways out forward from all of this. This might all seem a bit depressing and a bit disheartening, but I hope if we can talk about technology in these ways, it actually is a bit liberating because it frees us up as being the techie people from having all the answers and all the solutions and having this huge weight of expectation with, come on then, when are you going to transform the school? When are you going to make things better? Hopefully it kind of allows us to disengage from the hype and actually think a little bit more carefully about what we're going to do. So I'm really interested to think about what positives can we take from being more honest and realistic and critical and circumspect about technology and education. What can we actually do with all of this? And I've just got six suggestions for maybe the way that we carry on for the next couple of days. The first thing that I would love to happen is if when we discuss technology and education, particularly amongst policymakers and school leaders and parents, that we put technology at the end point of any discussion. We don't start off with the technology, we finish with the technology. So, for example, a lot of people talk about disengagement. We need to get kids engaged in schools, and therefore technology and games is a really good way of engaging kids. If that's the case, then I would want to start off with just saying, what can be done about the problem of student disengagement? What is student disengagement? What are the factors that lie behind it? What things do we already know might work to address these factors, and then how can we do those things? And I would imagine that none of the answers to those questions would involve technology. We, we know about student engagement and why kids come to school and pay attention and engage in, in the work that we try and get them to do. And we know a lot about the factors and the complexities behind it. So any disengagement strategy should have that conversation first, definitely, and seriously as well. And only at that point, might we say, how can technology support us in doing all those? So we're already not saying technology is going to fix disengagement. Technology comes in fifth as a way of doing stuff that we already know works and addressing factors that we already know are complex. And then you've got a completely different spin on the way technology is used. And then there's a final question. How might doing this with technology have other consequences? And there are always other consequences. Now, if we can put technology at the end of the conversation in education rather than the beginning, I think that's a really powerful way of actually um, talking about things like coding and flipped classrooms and everything else that people are trying to get us to talk about. And I think, secondly, we need to be a lot clearer about the reasons for using technology in education and the language for using technology in education. So I've already talked about this idea about getting away from the hype of ed tech. I would love for somebody today, you may have already done this, but come up with a buzzword bingo club card. It's also called bullshit bingo. 16 things or 20 things, 25 things that you don't want to hear. What might they be? Gamification, personalized learning, flipped, digital native. Or you can see the things that we need to move away from words like that and actually be more realistic about what we actually are talking about. So rather than talking about empowering learners, rather than talking about disrupting classrooms. What is it that we actually want to do? What are we trying to do here? The third thing I think is about history. I want us to talk about history. I want to talk about where we've been before. And in particular, acknowledging things that failed as well as worked. It's been 40 years, as I said, since this computer here. That gives us 40 years of being able to talk about what we know happened. And it would be really, really interesting to celebrate our failures, to have a bit more of a shared understanding about how technology in school plays out, and whether we're just setting ourselves up to repeat those things again. And we're thinking about the long-term effects of this technology in a much, much more nuanced way. So I was really interested to see, is it Helsingborg has got this museum of failure? It's a really interesting place if you want to go there. I would hope it's stuffed full of ed tech. I would hope it's full of interactive whiteboards and all the technologies that we've had over the past uh, 40 years. But it's a really interesting thing to try and do. So whenever my, I've got teachers now that want to do teacher research with me and master's thesis and PhD thesis, I'm trying to encourage teachers to do autopsies of ed tech, to go back to the scene of the crime 
from 10, 20 years ago, their technology use, and try and work out what actually happened, how did things play out, and why. And I think that's a much, much more powerful way of beginning to understand digitizations in schools than just imagineering or speculating about what might happen in the future. We already know what, what's happened. Why don't we look backwards as well as forwards? Fourth thing is just recognizing change as something that has to be worked at. It's really, really tricky, really, really complex. It's not going to happen overnight, and it's not just about adding technology to, to schools. And I'll skip past that. The leadership thing really, really worries me, but also really, really excites me. I think if I was in charge of the world, maybe Sweden, I'd have to learn to speak Swedish first, but I don't know, maybe I, that might be worth it. If I was in charge of Sweden, I would really put all my money into establishing dynamic, democratic leadership around ed tech. I think we should be spending a lot of money in employing new forms of leaders in schools who are not just teachers that are suddenly saddled with dealing with technology, but a kind of hybrid technology experts and also teachers. People that really understand the technology can also tinker around the place, but also have a really deep understanding of education. We need a kind of new cadre of professionals. I also think we should massively invest and upskill in IT technicians, rather than seeing them as people that come in and fix the technology, like I was using Carl earlier. IT technicians, I think, could be really high status professionals that really kind of drive what goes on in schools, being kind of chief information officers as well as being kind of um, a real force for change. And also this idea of allowing school communities to have much more of a say in the technology that gets used in schools, really getting students, teachers, parents, local employers, everyone in a school community to have more of a say. And the last thing as well is this idea about just stop taking education technology too seriously. I think we just need to get a massive dose of perspective about this. <coughs> We're not going to solve the world. We're not Martin Luther King. This list is just, I think, offensive. We're not going to change any games. But on the other hand, we can have slightly more of a, a kind of more inquisitive, a more modest approach to trying to make change with technology and just seeing what happens, being more tentative about things not pretending that we've got the solutions to everything. <coughs> so I'm not going to leave you with any answers. I'm not going to leave you with any solutions. One of my things is that I think we just need to talk about, have proper conversations about technology and education. One of the things that would be great was if a, tech, a conference like Maker Days wasn't just seen to be a cool technology and education conference, but it was just seen to be a cool conference that you had lots of people coming here that couldn't care less about technology, as well as just the teachers that do care about technology, because then you'd have some really powerful conversations. And on the flip side, it would be really, really powerful if these conversations that we're going to have over the next two days took place in other ed tech, that's uh, other education conferences, other education professional development that has nothing to do with technology at all. We're kind of operating in silos at the moment, where we have these conversations here, and then in education conferences we don't. So I think there's some really interesting conversations that we need to get going, some really interesting language that we need to be using. And last of all, I just think there's some really interesting questions that we need to start asking. So I wanted to say at the beginning, we need to move away from this idea of what works and why, because that's the question that people normally have at a conference like this. That's the criticism I always get about every talk I ever give. You've not told us what works and why. I've got no idea what works and why. You know what works and why. But I think you can find out what works and why in your own local context by asking better questions. So this question about what is new here is a really interesting thing to ask because it first of all focuses you on what continuities there are with technology use, but also where there might be slight discontinuities. And it focuses on everything from education practices, school processes, school structures, relationships between people, and also gets us into this idea of remediation. Where are we repeating things that have happened before, and how are they slightly changing? And where might this take us in the next iteration, and the next iteration? And it also gives us this sense of history. Where have we actually been before that might remind us about what we can learn from this time around? And if the answer to what is new here is nothing, that's not necessarily a problem at all. But we shouldn't believe any claims of any new things happening because of it. Hence, possibly coding. And I'll just finish off with a slightly better set of questions, I think, from Neil Postman, who's a fantastic media critic from the 1990s, who wrote some brilliant stuff about television, 
and was just beginning to write, write about the internet when unfortunately he passed away. But Postman asked these five questions to any technology, which I think is a really interesting way to finish off. What is the problem to which a technology claims to be a solution? So think about the coding push in Swedish schools at the moment. Think about maker technology, whatever it is you want to think about. What is the problem to which it claims to be a solution? Whose problem is it? And that's a really interesting question to ask. Because often a lot of these problems are not necessarily problems that come from teachers or come from students. Often they come from institutions or management or politicians or Ivanka Trump. And it also gives you the idea that technologies have politics. What new problems might be created by solving the old one? This is this idea of unexpected consequences or unintended consequences. If we do X, what else might happen? And that's a really interesting thing to think about. What people and institutions might be most harmed by this? And I think that is a really important question, particularly from the research I do. Inequality is not solved by technology. Often technologies amplify inequalities that we already have. So bright, white, middle-class boys tend to benefit from coding in UK schools. Good for them, not so much good for everybody else. And also this idea that one size does not fit all. Some people benefit from others. And then last of all, and I think this is the question that a whole 300 maker teachers should be able to answer, <laughs> what alternative uses might be made of the technology? And one of the things I've tried to get across in my own work is that how technologies are socially shaped. You might get given an iPad or an interactive whiteboard or a micro bit and be told what to do with it from your curriculum orders or from your leader. But it's shaped by the context within which it's used. Your, your students will start messing around with it and using it in slightly different ways. But as teachers and as schools, you can also start reshaping these technologies to use them in slightly different ways while still ticking all the boxes. And that's a really interesting way to think about everything we're going to talk about today. When we talk about curriculum orders, when we talk about tech that's been given to us from, from on high, how might we repurpose it, reappropriate, reappropriate it, and shape it in other ways to meet our own needs? I think that's a really interesting question to ask for the rest of, rest of the two days. So without any further ado, I shall finish there. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, I have a couple of questions before I let, let you go. <laughs> Thank you so much for That's a really, right. really nice I must apologise. I, I only flew in from Australia last, uh, yesterday. You know, sometimes you speak and you're not actually aware of speaking and you're just saying stuff. That's kind of how it was about halfway through. So <laughs> I didn't notice. Ah. One question I have is that you had this sort of switch where you suddenly got the notion that leadership was important. Mm. How did that happen? We did a big ethnography of three years in three schools looking at how technology was being used. And the whole idea of an ethnography is you just go in and you see what's going on. You hang out and you follow whatever it is. As soon as we started talking to teachers and students and parents and IT technicians, leadership, policy, blah, 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 blah. so then we began talking with the lead, and it suddenly unraveled that leadership and technology in Australian schools at least was a huge thing. Now one of the reasons it became a really big thing in schools was the Australian government basically stopped all of its policies in 2012, stopped meddling, and schools were just left to drift. Sort it out for yourselves. So they'd gone from a situation of the, of the Australian government saying, you must have one, bring your own device, one device, one to one, we'll give you the money, we'll give you the kit, to suddenly doing nothing. And suddenly the leaders were like, actually, we really quite liked the, the government being involved, because at least then we were being told what to do, and now we had to find out for ourselves. And we found these three different schools just flailing around trying to find out what to do. Um, and it was really interesting to see how the three different sets, set up of leadership in the three different schools was having really different effects on the way that technology, technology was being used in the three schools. And it was the leaders that were having the most impact. And it was really interesting then when you talk to people about, well, who's in charge of IT here? And they'd often say, oh, it's Steve. You know, he just works down the corridor in, in social sciences. He tells us what to do. And I thought, all right, Steve's right. And then you began to see how the informal patterns of leadership worked. And I think have always happened in ed tech. But that also explained why technology wasn't being used in other parts of the schools quite so well. And, I think, and then we suddenly started looking at policies and the way that leaders were being trained, and there's a huge vacuum. You're trained to be a leader, and you're told to lead, but you're never really trained to lead technology. 
which is a very different thing to other aspects of education. And the people at the very top would say, I didn't come to this job to, you know, buy a server or work out what the best you know, filtering is for my internet. I've got no idea what I'm doing. So it's a complete kind of vacuum, I think. But it was actually just by talking with people that we actually kind of realised. A second question. You, um, you spoke about the sort of uh, importance of learning by failures and you showed the cool museum in Healthy mm. Boy. Do you know of any sort of studies or any places where you've actually done that in a sort of meaningful fashion in education. I know that sort of uh, CEOs and in uh, sort of uh, IT environments, there's been, for example, fuck up nights at pubs where CEOs <laughs> share their miserable stories. So they get drunk as well. They get drunk Excellent. and uh, everybody like hugs each other, etc. <laughs> and it's really nice. Uh, it's supposedly really nice at least. That's something yeah. to do for tonight. After yeah. you've been to Lynn Education, all yeah. get drunk and tell each and other And tell each other about up. failures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm stick all it up video. for it. Uh, no, in, a, in, a, in an instance, in, in, a, in academia, history of education is probably the most marginalised bit. Like mm. Nobody's interested in hearing about mm. history of education, and in technology even more so. Mm. And I think one of the things we've got in this field is it's, it's forward-looking. As I said, we're trying to make mm. things better. People are not interested in what's happened and what didn't work. They're only interested in what will work. So this idea of always being future-focused and looking five years, we need to get around that. And in our field, I've done a little bit of research where I've gone back to people. <coughs> I went back to all of the politicians and tech and industry people that were involved in the 1980s push for, for computers in schools, and I talked to them about it. All of them were like, why on earth do you want to talk to me about this? Why are you interested in this? They, they, they couldn't see it, and they were actually involved in it. So I've not done any, any other work than that. It would be so, great. So we look forward to more research and more talking over a glass of wine about failures. Absolutely, and I think, yeah. actually, if that became part of our common understanding, and everyone just kind of <laughs> saw that as important. I'm mm. sure we would do that. But I'm not aware of any bit of education of outside of technology that really talks about history and failures. Do we do it in curriculum, for example? Do we do it in professional mm. development? I mean, we, there's such a wealth of kind of experience. Yeah. Thank you so much, Neil. Uh, I thought sort of what could we give you that you haven't received before at a conference? And I'm pretty I'm sure... I'm a bit worried about this. I've seen what <laughs> Carl does with stuff. <laughs> I went into his workshop and they were oh. building lots of robots of yeah, him so his face Yeah, so Anya is here somewhere. Ah. Uh, <laughs> Anya is a colleague. She normally 3D scans horses, That's but she, she also has a go at people right. making like... This is Niels, who's going to do our masterclass. So we thought it would be nice to have a small Neil as well. What are you going to do with it? Well, we're going to give it to you. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, <laughs> the, 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 the physical Neil Selwyn. Thank sort you. Of in a small version. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Anya is over there ready with a scanner. Oh, so with uh, that, thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh,